Well, good afternoon, fellow Kirby Institutionites. Uh, I'm uh, John Caldor from the Public Health Interventions Research Program uh, and also the coordinator of the uh, Global Health Initiatives at the Kirby Institute. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second in our series on global health within the usual Kirby Institute seminar series. Um, but before doing so, I would like to, as is our usual practice, acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which we are located. Uh, in my case, it's the uh, Gadigal people here in the eastern part of Sydney uh, and uh, acknowledge traditional owners uh, all around the country where, where you are joining us from. We are very fortunate to have an outstanding speaker today, uh, known to some of you, but maybe not to all of you. Susanna Vajneri joined the Kirby Institute uh, about three and a half years ago uh, with long experience in the area of neglected tropical diseases, having worked in, in uh, African countries and in, in uh, Timor-Leste uh, after having training in, in basic science, public health, in international development. Um, and I think it's fair to say that she's really taken this area of endeavor for the Kirby Institute up to a new level over the last three and a half years, both in terms of uh, increasing and broadening the, 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 the scope of the work we do in regard to the types of the diseases that we're looking at, the countries where we're working, the disciplines that we're bringing to bear, and also an expanding team of, of uh, doctoral students and postdocs and, and uh, other uh, um, dynamic colleagues. Uh, so Susanna is going to be talking to us today about a key theme in this area, which is uh, the, uh, the need to improve strategies for the control of neglected tropical diseases. So I'll uh, hand over to Susanna. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. I'm just setting up to share my screen and start the slide presentation. Please let me know that should be working now. Thanks very much. Thanks, John, for the, the introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today and, and, and show you uh, our work and, and you know, my work over the last three and a half years as well as after joining the Kirby. So, um, um, I would also begin by acknowledging the medical people who are the traditional custodians of the land from where I'm joining this meeting. And I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may also be joining today. So um, I should start by saying that I will be presenting the work of my team, the, the NTD research group, and that includes um, current uh, postdocs, as well as former members of the team, and also work from PhD students and, and, and the master's student. And I should also uh, and also should acknowledge the, the essential contribution of, um, uh, of the chair of the uh, Global Health Advisory Group. And I should say that none of these would have been possible without very strong in-country collaborations. And I will mention um, individually um, some of them as I go along. So what are NTDs, neglected tropical diseases? So you can see a list of over 20 diseases. So they are a large group of infectious diseases that can be caused by protozoa or viruses, helminths, bacteria, uh, uh, fungi, or parasites. Um, and they affect more than 1 billion people uh, worthwhile, uh, particularly people uh, living in impoverished um, uh, communities. They uh, most of the times are not lethal, but they impair physical and cognitive development, particularly in children, and therefore then um, you know, due to their morbidity, uh, contribute to limited productivity in adults, uh, therefore perpetuating the, the poverty cycle. And their name, so NTDs, also reflects the fact that historically they have received little uh, attention and, and funding. And I will be talking about the, the NTDs that are bolded here uh, in gold. So I'll give just kind of a, a brief introduction about uh, each one of them. So I'll start with the salt transmitted helminths or STH. 
they are um, the, um, the most common of most common of NTDs, uh, a group of five species of intestinal parasites. They are transmitted through the ingestion of contaminated feces or uh, skin penetration if you walk barefoot, uh, and infections uh, may lead to growth delays and anemia. And uh, one or the main strategy for their control is um, uh, preventive chemotherapy, which uh, consists uh, in this case of, of distributing albendazole or mebendazole uh, to populations at risk. So I should actually say, uh, going back to introduction, that these diseases that I will be talking about um, are diseases where WHO recommends a strategy called preventive chemotherapy, um, which is the regular distribution of medications to populations or subgroups of populations at risk. And uh, when this is given to, to entire communities is called mass drug administration or MDA. So I'll be talking a lot about PC preventive chemotherapy or mass drug administration. So in the case of STH, the goal is to eliminate morbidity. So elimination as a public health pro problem. I will also be talking about scabies, which is a skin NTD. It's caused by a mite and it leads to itching and rashes and may cause uh, bacterial uh, skin infections that's uh, that, uh, known as impetigo. You may uh, remember previous talks by uh, Lucia Romani, who uh, during her PhD, uh, so she led um, or participated in, in, in RC, in randomized cluster control trials showing that MDA with so mass drug administration with vivermectin, which is another medication, is more effective in controlling scabies um, than the usual uh, or uh, so far conventional approach, which is delivery of um, topical permethrin to infected individuals and contacts. I will also be mentioning schistosomiasis. So this is another parasitic disease caused by mainly by uh, these three species of schistosoma. Uh, is transmitted through skin penetration and it has uh, an intermediate host, uh, several species of, of snails. Uh, it leads to malnutrition, um, anemia, and, and also additional severe morbidities in, in some cases. Again, um, the, the strategy for control is preventive chemotherapy with Prazinquantel uh, to reach elimination as a public health problem. Uh, you, will, you will probably be familiar with trachoma. Uh, so trachoma is caused by a bacteria, Chlamydia trachomatis, um, and uh, is transmitted through flies. Uh, leading to the infection of, of the eye and, and repeated infections uh, lead to uh, blindness. Uh, again, one of the main strategies for control in order to reach elimination uh, as a public health problem is um, distribution of um, the antibiotic azithromycin to entire communities. I will also talk about yours. Um, a, a recent addition to our portfolio, I should say. So it's another skin NTD. It's also caused by a bacteria, Tryponema pertenu, that um, is very similar to the bacteria that causes syphilis, and it leads to chronic. So it leads to these um, lesions that then lead to chronic disfigurement. And this is uh, particular in the sense that this NTD is actually. Uh, targeted for eradication, meaning global elimination, elimination of infection, and that is to be achieved with uh, mass drug administration with azithromycin. I will also briefly mention, finally, uh, lymphatic filariasis, which is another parasitic NTD uh, transmitted by mosquitoes, and it causes uh, abnormal enlargement of body parts, um, mainly um, limbs and, and genitals, and it leads to, to pain and, and disability and stigma. And its control uh, is through mass drug administration with albendazole and DEC, and sometimes also with, with ivermectin. And WHO aims for it to be eliminated as a public health problem, so no morbidity. Um, just wanted to show you a schematic that kind of uh, guides us in the research that, that we're trying to take forward. 
So basically, these are the entities that I've mentioned that I will be talking about a bit more. Um, so in terms of control strategies, I talked a lot about preventive chemotherapy, and I will be mainly focusing on that, either targeted, so directed to school age children or mass drug administration, tar kind of reaching entire communities. Uh, there are additional control strategies such as vector control um, and also water sanitation and hygiene. In terms of research methods, so we, I will be talking about some of our intervention trials and some other epidemiological surveys, so monitoring and evaluation surveys, so to, to allow us and the Ministry of Health of countries that we are collaborating with to assess the impact of these interventions. We also do research on improving diagnostics to, to better um, identify and, and, and quantify burden of disease, um, sometimes in an you know, in a integrated manner. And we are also initiating uh, studies in, in um, uh, social science research, health economics and mathematical modeling. And I'll just uh, briefly mention the plan uh, in some, for some of these studies. So again, the aim in the end is to lead, uh, raise evidence to lead uh, to policy change and improvement of these current strategies for control and elimination of NTDs. This is just a, a, a brief layout of the themes that will run through these presentations. So uh, I'm dividing uh, this presentation in three types of studies. So uh, the first set is around um, randomized control trials to optimize strat strategies for control of soil transmitted helminths. So I'll mention two studies, one in Vietnam and another in the Solomon Islands. Another theme um, of research that we conduct is around um, intervention studies on integrated control of NTDs, where we are assessing the impact of existing drug combinations on additional or multiple NTDs. And I will be talking about the study that I'm leading in Timor-Leste, as well as two studies uh, led by MCRI and Lucia Romani. And uh, I will finally mention um, our studies um, supporting the Ministry of Health in endemic countries to assess um, the impact of, of their own NTD control programs. And that includes trachoma, STH and Chisto, and also multiple NTDs in an integrated fashion. Okay, so I'll start with code STH, which stands for Community Deworming Against uh, STH, which is, I guess, the, the study that brought me to, to the Kirby. Um, these, as you can see, is work that I, you know, conducted by a large group of people, but I should mention um, the former trial coordinator, Naomi Clark, as well as uh, Claire Dyer, who is a, a current postdoc in the group. And um, of course, Dean Guyen in Vietnam, who is our project manager, and actually a former PhD student of Rebecca Troll, where we conduct our um, uh, PCR for STH diagnostics. Why did we want to conduct this trial? So um, I think I've mentioned that for STH, the current WHO recommendation is to target school age children. So uh, distribution of albendazole just targeting this age group. However, um, mathematical modeling studies and, and the pilot that I led uh, in Timur uh, suggest that expanding these deworming programs from school age children to entire communities um, will impact or may impact transmission of STH and therefore may lead to fewer reinfections in, in children. And that is precisely the hypothesis that we set out to test. So we are conducting this trial in schools across uh, all 13 districts um, of Dak Lak province in the central highlands of Vietnam. It's showing the uh, 64 schools where we conducted this trial. This is just a, a, a study design kind of figure, just kind of calling your attention to, to the main intervention. So basically we had an intervention arm where um, so 32 schools and surrounding communities where both children and schools, uh, children at school and communities received the albendazole medication. Then we had a control arm where only uh, children attending those 32 schools in this arm 
received the medication. And we measured infection in school age children, so in these 64 clusters. And this was done by PCR, as I said, at the University of Melbourne in Rebecca Trope's lab. And we measured infection at baseline, and then also 12 months after the administration of albendazole. Um, so this was a, a large undertaking in collaboration with the Tain Guyan University and the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education um, of Vietnam, of Dak Lac. Uh, we had 13 teams of, of four people each uh, led by Dean, plus supervisors and lab technicians to a total of um, 63 staff under a Dean's um, supervision. Uh, and they were helped by almost 300 village health workers and hum, Hamlet health staff, so community health workers. We, in three weeks, we visited um, 113 Hamlets in the intervention arm, giving medications to uh, around uh, 90,000 people. And we also gave tablets to at school, to school age children, to 21,000 children. At each time point, we, con we collected around 9,000 stool samples that were then analyzed by PCR. We have some lovely pictures of, of people participating in, in the study. I, I just want to briefly mention um, a baseline risk factor analysis conducted by Angus Hughes, a, a master's student at the School of Population Health who did his research project with us just now. And so um, basically, uh, this is showing these multi-level uh, uh, analysis, uh, showing that, for instance, belonging to an ethnic minority increases odds of infection with STH at baseline. And, and things like wash factors, like uh, defecating on the ground and not in the toilet, also increases your odds of infection. This is the preliminary analysis that Claire is, is conducting with hand and wand here at the Kirby. Um, so disappointingly, um, there appears not to be a significant difference in prevalence reduction between control and intervention uh, arms at the 12 month follow-up, which is not what the hypothesis assumed. Um, on the other hand, uh, we are seeing a borderline significantly greater reduction in infection intensity in the intervention arm compared to the control arm. So basically in the control arm, there's a higher proportion of children with high and moderate, moderate infection intensity infections compared to the intervention arm. Okay, so as I said, this is ongoing. We also will do some individual level analysis. Um, and, uh, and then we are also collaborating with Luke Ofeng um, at the Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, um, who is, so Luke is a mathematical modeler with whom I've been collaborating in the past. And basically the idea is to predict the long-term impact of these two approaches, targeted versus community deworming. So I guess we're hoping because we only did one round of um, albendazole distribution and we only measured the impact after 12 months, we are interested in seeing what would happen if we had given um, albendazole over a longer period of time and kind of followed it through over a longer period of time because usually these STH programs are done every year for you know decades sometimes, like actually most times. There's also two PhD students doing their PhD kind of embedded in this trial. So Paul um, is doing uh, health economics um, analysis um, under my supervision, as well as Caroline and Virginia. And, and Phoebe is looking at the community acceptability and, and the health systems feasibility of these two um, approaches for um, preventive chemotherapy. And you may have noticed uh, that I mentioned that um, belonging to an ethnic minority increases your odds of infection. So Claire, uh, we're also starting a, a small pilot study to further investigate that uh, connection. I, now, uh, I will now turn to Solomon Islands and the work of Brendan Lee, uh, who is another PhD student in the group. And these work uh, aims to assess the impact um, that ivermectin MDA uh, 
for scabies control as on salt transmitted helminths. I took that picture <laughs> when we could travel. Uh, and this is you know, the current times of Zoom trainings. So RISE or regimens of ivermectin for scabies elimination is, is a trial led by MCRI by Professor Andrew Steer. And it aims to compare one versus two doses of ivermectin MDA on scabies. Um, so you may remember I mentioned in the introduction that Lucia was involved in, in the first studies demonstrating the impact of ivermectin MDA on scabies. And those studies used two doses of, of ivermectin uh, one to two weeks apart, but um, most of preventive chemotherapy uh, programs uh, for all other diseases only use one round of MDA in each, you know, each year or biannually. So having this need of having two doses of ivermectin for scabies control complicates a bit the implementation of MDA for scabies control. So Andrew and this team are trying, are doing this trial to see if one dose is just as effective. Anyway, this, the work I'm trying to present here is about the impact that this MDA uh, for scabies also may have on STH. So this was done in the Solomon Islands, as I said, um, in, in 20 villages across the, the Western province. And again, we collected uh, stool samples at baseline, so just prior to MDA, and then 20 months after the ivermectin administration. Brendan has started the analysis of, of, actually completed the analysis for the baseline data. You can see here that more than half of the population sampled is infected with at least one STH. And he also conducted a risk factor analysis. So for instance, you can see here that uh, owning a household latrine decreases the odds um, of infection um, with, with Nicator, which is one of the STH species. Um, this is an ongoing study, so the, the, the follow-up uh, took place last year. So we are now um, with Rebecca. So Rebecca is now completing um, the PCR analysis to diagnose the different STH. Um, and we are hoping to have these results early next year. And um, so um, it will be interesting to use this, this data um, in the context of, of a wider um, MDA, so mass drug administration program that is happening at or is going to happen in the Solomon Islands. So with uh, the support of the World Scabies Program, uh, the Ministry of Health is uh, rolling out the national uh, MDA program for scabies control. And so the results of this study may provide um, some light on whether that program may also impact um, STH. Nevertheless, uh, given the high presence of STH in the country, as, as I showed, um, it is advisable that the Solomon Islands scale up their current school dewarming programs with albendazole, which are the WHO recommendations. And we, in fact, have been discussing with them that need and, and hope that can um, you know, um, facilitate that, that scale up. <clears throat> OK, so. Uh, now I will turn to our second research theme, which is on integrated control of NTDs. And I'll go through a few studies um, testing the impact of existing drug combinations on multiple NTDs. So this study, um, this first study is a, is a collaboration with Josh Francis at Menzies, and it's also part of Brendan's uh, PhD. And it takes place um, in Team Wood. So I need to acknowledge Salvador Amaral, who is uh, our project or was our project manager in Timor and is now currently working with, with Josh and, and Menzies. So uh, as I said, it takes place in Timor. Uh, so the Ministry of Health of Timor West in 2019 um, implemented a mass drug administration to eliminate lymph lymphatic filariasis. So basically they used a triple drug combination, which is relatively new for uh, LF control, uh, lymphatic filariasis control, consisting of ivermectin, DC, and albendazole. And we aim to assess the impact that this mass drug administration with this triple drug therapy um, could have on um, scabies and STH. 
So we recruited children from six schools in three municipalities of the country, and we collected um, stool samples and conducted skin examinations at baseline. And then 18 months after the MDA was implemented by the Ministry of Health. And we are now finalizing the statistical analysis of the data. Okay, so in terms of scabies, you will see that just with one dose of ivermectin, there was a very significant decrease of um, prevalence, scabies prevalence from almost 40% to 13%. And similarly, um, a decrease in impetigo from 12 to 2%. On the other hand, looking at the STH um, prevalence of Ascaris lumbricoris, which is the, the main species that we found in Timor, um, remained at similar levels. Um, this is due to the, this is not surprising given that we had an 18 month follow up. And usually, STH programs need to happen every six months or every 12 months, depending on, depending on prevalence levels. So there's reinfection happening. Uh, on the other hand, we seem to see uh, that the prevalence of Trichuris trichuria, which is another STH that is usually not so common, um, actually remained lower, lower at follow-up, even though those 18 months had passed, so compared to the, to the almost 5% prevalence that we found at baseline. So this was actually one of the main reasons we, we, we wanted to conduct this study because um, albendazole, which is the medication usually used for STH control, is not very efficacious on tricuries, but the combination of ivermectin to that, to albendazole, uh, with albendazole, is, is thought to be more efficacious. And so this is, uh, I guess, uh, another demonstration of effective or a demonstration of effectiveness, and there's not that many around. Oops. Okay, so uh, in terms of conclusion, so we, with this study, we are providing evidence that one dose of ivermectin um, as delivered as part of an lymphatic filariasis uh, program is beneficial for scabies and also for trichuries. Um, and so we are now in discussing with the Minister of Health of Timor to you know, uh, try to promote the needs and, and try to raise some evidence to then advocate with WHO for the donation of additional ivermectin for scabies control. And so I'm, I didn't mention, but I'll mention now. So these MDA, these mass drug administration programs are being rolled out in, in most countries where NTDs are endemic. And you may have heard of the in, 12, in 2012, there was this London declaration where um, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company, companies committed to donate uh, these medications that I've been talking about, albendazole, mabendazole, prazinquantel, ivermectin, to control or eliminate several entities. However, you know, they committed to certain numbers based on the evidence of burden of disease. And, and this means that uh, you know, for STH, there's only enough drugs for children. Uh, ivermectin is only donated for uh, oncocerciasis elimination, which is another NTD. So basically, there's some bottlenecks in terms of scale up and actually effectively getting rid of morbidity and, and of NTDs uh, because of these uh, constraints in donations. So currently, there's no ivermectin donations for scabies, but as we move on and, and raise evidence that indeed one dose of ivermectin can, can significantly reduce scabies, you know, maybe uh, the evidence needed to uh, increase those donations. Um, I will now mention two studies that uh, are led by Professor Andrew Steer at MCRI, and I'm mentioning them here because um, they have the long-term collaboration of, of Lucia Romani, who's now a senior research fellow in our group, who you know. Uh, so one is Big Shift, and this is a large-scale before and after study. And again, this study ran alongside um, a mass drug administration campaign implemented by the Ministry of Health of Fiji to eliminate uh, lymphatic filariasis. So again, um, it used the, the triple drug combination, um, ivermectin, DC, and valbendazole. And 
This study aimed to assess the impact of this LFMDA on scabies um, as a secondary and impetigo as a secondary outcomes, but uh, mainly um, it aimed to determine the impact on presentations at health uh, facility level and hospitalizations associated with severe bacterial infections. And uh, it took place uh, in the Northern Division of, of, of Fiji. Um, you can see here that while well, the starting prevalence of of scabies was not that high, and I guess the impact was lower than in previous studies. However, there were still a, a significant decrease in the prevalence of moderate to severe scabies, um, and a, a, a significant decrease in impetigo prevalence as well. But what um, the study showed was actually that um, there was a, a 20% reduction in um, the incidence of hospitalizations and primary health presentations of skin and soft tissue infections, um, <clears throat> which is a very significant finding and again shows additional benefits of ivermectin MDA that was implemented for LF and it shows that it's also beneficial for um, other conditions, in this case, uh, hospitalizations and skin disease presentation. The other study that Lucia has been involved is part of the FIT trial. So this stands for the Fiji Integrated Thera Therapy Trial, and that is also led by Andrew Steer. And this study was a, a three-arm randomized control trial. And again, it took it was built on top of um, another a similar MDA, so a mass drug administration campaign to um, eliminate lymphatic filariasis um, and in Fiji. And this was at a time where, um, so I think I, I mentioned that usually uh, ALF elimination programs will have been relying on two drugs, um, DEC and albendazole. But recently uh, there were trials like this one demonstrating that the addition of ivermectin would accelerate elimination. And this was important for countries that have been doing LFMDAs for several years and, not, and are not reaching the targets of elimination as a public health problem. So as I said, um, so then the FIT trial for scabies was uh, a non-inferiority trial. So one arm had two doses, uh, so to assess the impact on, on scabies. So one arm had two doses of scabies, as you may remember, I mentioned that uh, Lucia's studies previously um, used two, two doses of ivermectin for scabies control. So one of the arms had the, the, the two dose um, ivermectin, the other arm had one dose of ivermectin and the third arm um, had uh, the conventional uh, standard treatment, which is identifying cases and giving permethrin to cases and, and household contacts. You can see here that there was a, a very significant reduction in all three arms uh, of, of prevalence, in, in scabies prevalence in all the treatment groups. And so again, um, the study, so this was a non-inferiority trial and, and, and basically suggests that uh, one dose of ivermectin is effective against scabies, which is in agreement with what we also saw more recently in timor <clears throat> Okay, so um, now I'd like to um, provide some examples of our work supporting the Ministry of Health of endemic countries to assess the impact of their NTD control programs. And these include, um, kind of supporting them to implement surveys to inform the need of a, a mass drug administration program. So um, this is an example, um, such an example is a trachoma survey that we conducted in Nauru, where I worked cl closely with Su Chen um, Apadinue, who is a public health nurse in Nauru leading the trachoma uh, program. And again, this was a, a large collaboration supported by the Fred Hollows Foundation. Okay, so why um, did we need this, this survey? So basically for countries to decide whether they will start a master administration pro, uh, program, 
um, they, they, the usual path is to do a prevalence survey. And then if it's the prevalence of that NTD is above a certain threshold, that is different for each disease, um, then the country decides whether they need, there's a need to do MDA or not. So um, in Nauru, as, um, what happens with trachoma is that um, in different or in, in some Pacific Island countries, the epidemiology of trachoma differs from other endemic settings in, in Africa, uh, in the sense that there is a high prevalence of the clinical signs of trachoma, which usually are what is assessed during a prevalence um, survey. So there's high prevalence of TF or, or um, trachomatous inflammation follicular. So that's the clinical presentation of trachoma but there's no scarring. So that's kind of the result of continuing infection with chlamydia. Um, and, and some cases also demonstrated that if you try to measure the presence of bacteria in the eye, you actually don't see that many. So um, this means that now countries in the Pacific are trying to not only look at the clinical presentation of trachoma, but actually also look at the, the presence of the bacteria and of antibodies against, against the bacteria. And we conducted this, uh, I believe the first survey or large scale survey, although in a, in a small country where we had these three components. So we, we uh, supported the Ministry of Health, not only in the clinical examination, but then children were also asked to provide uh, a, a eye swab to test by PCR for active chlamydia infection, and also a dry blood spot to measure uh, seroprevalence of anti, anti trachoma antibodies. And these analyses was, was done um, by, so the laboratory work was, was done by Beth Catlett and Mitchell Starr in Philip uh, Cunningham's lab at St. Vincent's. So you'll see here, that there was indeed a high prevalence of um, clinical presentation of trachoma. 22% of children um, had TF. And, but we also see, saw that by PCR, there was an even, a even higher presence of, of, of infection, uh, 34%, and, and uh, uh, also high levels of antibodies against trachoma. And you can see here that both antibodies and um, and clinical presentation increased with age, while uh, in green you have PCR results, so they remain around the same level. So um, basically, these results uh, showed that there are indeed, you know, there is indeed trachoma in Nauru, and so therefore um, the the Ministry of Health of Nauru started an MDA in the following last year in 2020, um, and. Um, uh, we also decided. Um, we also decided you know, so to to do an additional survey, taking advantage of this MDA with azithromycin. Um, so Lucia is now uh, looking at these results. So basically, you you may know that uh, azithromycin is well. You will know uh, <laughs> following the Kirby tradition with with uh, uh, you know, the kind of one of the main areas of research in this institute so that azithromycin is used for treatment of, of STIs. Um, and so it's plausible to think that MDA with azithromycin will also have additional benefits on, on STIs. And, and we knew that Nauru had previously reported um, high prevalence of, of um, chlamydia and gonorrhea and, and other STIs. So we used this opportunity to conduct a cross-sectional survey before and after the MDA with azithromycin for trachoma elimination took place. So we went back to the communities and recruited around 300 adults. Um, and again, uh, um, collected urine samples uh, that were um, sent to St. Vincent's and for analysis. And here I'm just showing the results, the first results um, on chlamydia where you can see again that there was a, a significant um, reduction in prevalence between uh, baseline. So before azithromycin MDA um, and eight months after that MDA took place. 
So again, these results have been fed up, fed back to the to the Ministry of Health um, to you know to have further discussions on on whether these would be um, a feasible strategy for control not only of trachoma but also of STIs. A similar example still on trachoma of supporting the Ministry of Health in making decisions regarding their NTD control programs is this trachoma survey in, in Schweizel province in the Solomon Islands. And this was led in the field by Oliver Sukana, the NTD um, unit lead. And the analysis is now being led by Claire Dyer. And again, it was supported by the Fred Hollows Foundation. So the rationale for had adding these um, kind of layers, these two extra layers <clears throat> to a trachoma survey, so a collection of, of eye swabs and, and dried blood spots, was for different reasons. So the Solomon Islands has been known to be endemic for trachoma, and they have been uh, implementing MDA since 2016. And so what happens is like you countries conduct a few rounds of MDA, then they measure the impact. And once the prevalence reaches 5% for trachoma, then that's the signal that there's no more need for MDA and the country enters a surveillance stage. In 2019, there was the surveillance survey. And in Schweizel, uh, it shows that the prevalence of TF was back up to 11%. So the clinical presentation of trachoma. And because of what I've explained of this specific enigma, where there may be the clinical presentation, but not actual infection, um, there was the need to repeat the survey with these additional components. So as in Nauru, um, we also looked at the presence of infection and the presence of, of antibodies. Um, so these are the results from those um, 15 clusters with, with uh, over 600 children um, examined and with samples collected. Okay, so just looking at the overall results, you can see that the clinical presentation of trachoma was 18%, um, which is quite high. But if you look at the corresponding PCR results, we only detected uh, bacteria in 8.5% in of the children. And antibodies were present uh, at levels similar to, to the clinical presentation. And again, the, the, the prevalence of clinical trachoma typically increases um, with age as well as, as the antibodies. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, this means, so these results again were fed, were transmitted and are being discussed with Fred Hollows and the Ministry of Health and, and WHO to decide what to do. So basically the prevalence of bacteria is above 5%. So Schweizel needs another round of MDA, but because um, you know the clinical presentation is higher than then the presence of bacteria, it means that there are other infectious agents uh, leading to that phenotype. And we are also establishing collaborations with, with a group in, in the States to, to look into that. The last example on trachoma is um, this um, work that you probably are, many of you are familiar with. Um, which is uh, the work of, of Professor John Calder and Kylie Culling in the National Trachoma Surveillance and Reporting Unit. So this unit was established in 2006 by the Department of Health and it has been based at the Kirby since 2010. And basically the roles of this unit is to analyze the data collected by each jurisdiction where trachoma is endemic in Australia and um, kind of analyze trends um, and discuss continuation of strategies, and we will also manage the submission of the trachoma elimination dossier to WHO, uh, because um, uh, Australia is the only high-income country where trachoma is still endemic, but there is a commitment to eliminate trachoma as a public health problem, and, and that target should be reached very soon. So the, the strategy for control of trachoma in Australia are, are very similar to the international uh, recommendations. Um, 
except that the, the distribution of, of antibiotic of azithromycin um, is more flexible in the sense that is, it can be either community-wide or it can just be more targeted to um, in individuals and their household contacts. So you'll see here, you may have seen this in previous reports that um, trachoma prevalence, so the, the orange with the line with the circles is, is the national trend or the trend of these traditions where trachoma exists. And you can see that it has been declining and is very close to be under 5%, which is the, the threshold for um, MDA to stop and, and, and says that trachoma has been eliminated a, as a public health problem. There are, however, some communities in the Northern Territory in Western Australia where the prevalence of trachoma is still above 20 or, or 10%. So um, there is still some work to, to be done in terms of eliminating trachoma as a public health problem. Okay, um, but uh, yes, I guess the message is that um, we are almost reaching the 5% uh, target. I'd like to present now the final example of our support to Ministry of Health um, in endemic countries implementing MDA programs. Um, and these comes from Angola, which is a country in Southern Africa, not, uh, not in the, not, not banned from travel yet, but close, close to it, I guess, looking at the neighbors. Anyway, um, we, this study is uh, being led by Adam Bartlett, who is now conducting the, the analysis. Adam is a postdoc in, in, in our group. And this is in collaboration with the Mentor Initiative with funds from the End Fund. Um, and Sergio Lopes is uh, the Mentor Project Manager. And we were also um, uh, collaborating with Marta Palmerin from the Swiss Tropical um, Institute. And uh, that was, uh, so Marta was able to travel to, to Angola from Switzerland back in, back in, April or May this year when we in Australia could not um, travel. So she did the, the parasitological training of, um, of the teams in Angola. So this study was conducted in, in these three regions. So she, both schistosomiasis and uh, solid transmitted helminths um, are long recognized public health problems in, in Angola. Uh, there had been a, a baseline survey in 2014, and um, that led to the implementation of preventive chemotherapy programs. And basically, we were asked to support the implementation of uh, an impact assessment. So this was a parasitological assessment uh, using rapid diagnostic tests for schistosomiasis and also microscopy, microscopy for STH. Some of them have been sent to Melbourne for, for PCR, but most of them have been analyzed in the field. And there were also questionnaires on, on risk factors of, of infection. So I'm, I'm not going to go through details in terms of implementation. I just wanted to point out that, again, this was a large scale survey with more than 600 schools visited, with more than 18,000 kids um, tested by RDTs and 6,000 or almost 7,000 by microscopy. Um, unfortunately, the results were not quite what expected. So even after five or seven years of, of preventive chemotherapy, the prevalence of schistosomiasis was, was above 30%, so well above the threshold to stop preventive chemotherapy. And the same was true for um, STH. So these results have been presented to the Ministry of Health, who basically needs to continue their preventive chemotherapy programs, but also I guess, need to um, reflect on how to improve the effectiveness of these campaigns, potentially trying to reach kids who are not attending school, which is potentially a, a large proportion of children in Angola. Okay, so I'm almost done. So I just like to finish with um, a project that has recently started. So this is the Pacific Integrated NTD Elimination Project, or, or PINE. This is a, an initiative led by the NGO Bridges to Development with funds <clears throat> from Takeda uh, Pharmaceutical. 
this is a three-year project that so basically Bridges is supporting the Ministry of Health in Papua New Guinea, specifically West New Britain and Vanuatu to implement two rounds of mass drug administration to control or eliminate multiple entities in these um, settings. And that includes STH, SCABIS, YOS, LF, and PNG. And um, our group is responsible for supporting the Ministry of Health in Vanuatu to, um, to conduct the impact assessment um, of, of this integrated MDA. Um, so I'm working closely with Facia Taleo, who is a WHO um, um, representative in Vanuatu, and, and Claire is also working on, on this project. So basically, we are actually, as we speak, uh, conducting the baseline surveys, or they are, um, in Vanuatu. And so these are integrated surveys, as I said, we're collecting uh, samples for STH and also doing clinical examinations for scabies, yaws, and, and leprosy. Um, and we are also requesting uh, uh, dried blood spots from a subset of participants to do integrated um, serology analysis using MacPix here um, uh, at um, Faculty of Medicine to look at entities, but also at vaccine preventable diseases. So, and we aim to, to test uh, almost, uh, or to recruit uh, almost 10,000 participants across these three provinces in um, Vanuatu where MDA is taking place as well. Okay, this is the last. Um, I just wanted to finish on a recently awarded grant that will allow, allow us to build on the previous project. So uh, I'm leading an NHMRC partnership grant um, in collaboration with several other investigators and implementation partners, including uh, other CIs from the Kirby, John and Virginia and, and Lucia. And so as partners, we have Pine implementing that MDA with the Ministry of Health in PNG and Vanuatu. We also have the World Scabies Program, um, where uh, led by Andrew Steer, but with the participation of, of John and, and Lucia that are rolling out um, with the Ministry of Health in the Solomon Islands, um, MDA for scabies, and also Fred Allo's foundation, so for trachoma, <clears throat> and the WHO that is um, supporting yours um, elimination. Basically the aims, so this will be a five-year project, and again, kind of following the, the themes that uh, some of them I've been um, kind of describing, so using improved diagnostics for integrated um, prevalence surveys, then uh, using geostatistical modeling to better um, kind of predict um, areas in need of MDA, and uh, also a component on L systems feasibility and community acceptability of this integrated MDA, and finally cost effectiveness analysis. I think that's it. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Susanna. Um, fantastic, comprehensive overview. I, I think I was, I, I said how, I was started off by saying how much it expanded um, our work in this area, and I think I was sort of under understating that. It's it's um, even though, as you say, I'm involved in a number of these projects, the scope of it is really impressive um, to see laid out like that. Um, so we have just four minutes left for some quick, so maybe some very quick responses. Um, so Jonathan's asked about um, issues of drug resistance in mass drug administration, and maybe you could give a very quick answer to that, even though it's a very top, complicated question. Yes, sorry, I'm trying to stop sharing, but I can't really. Sorry. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, yes, no, that is, um, Thanks for that question. I, I, I kind of mentioned the zithromycin MDA many times because I was hoping somebody would raise that. Yes, it is, it is, it is an issue. But I mean, I guess on one hand, um, for trachoma itself, I don't think resistance has been detected. But obviously, for STH is an issue. So in in um, in Nauru, we are actually um, also in the process of trying to assess whether that. Um, whether that MDA could have, uh, you know, ha has, uh, or, or the, if there is resistance, the resistance to, to azithromycin for, in terms of STAs, uh, STIs, I guess, as I said, for trachoma, it hasn't been documented, but for yours, for instance, it is a very big concern. And actually for yours programs, 
we, as we roll out MDA, we need to test for the development of resistance. So it is a concern that depending on disease, people are following more or less, I guess, closely or, or trying to detect it and act on it if it appears. Thanks, Selena. Um, so Caroline's asked about, in relation to the code STH, whether a reinfection uh, following the MDA could have affected the prevalence of uh, Americanus. Yeah, so yes, so 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 basically there will always be reinfection because SCAR is and um, STH eggs live in the environment and they are quite tough. Um, so they, they can survive for months or actually SCARIs, they can survive for years, which is why programs for STH control need to be repeated every, every single year for decades. Now, the prevalence still comes down slightly and the intensity of infection comes down more. I guess what we were hoping is that by getting rid of the community reservoir of infection, that we would be able to detect that extra benefit in children, um, but we didn't so far. Okay, and another great question with a very long answer uh, from a relation to, once we go below 5% for trachoma in Australia, how do we maintain prevalence below 5%? Um, well, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think, I mean, John will be able, or Kyle, if she's here, be able to talk at length on, on this. I mean, um, I'm also part of the unit now, so I mean, I can say, that obviously, you know, I didn't mention the, the rest of the safe strategy, but basically that means environmental changes. So that is around providing, um, you know, communities access to water and housing and basically environment and environmental conditions that will not allow for transmission of disease. And that's, I think, the, the effort that the Department of Health is now discussing how on how, you know, how to make that happen. Okay, um, we're about a minute out, and I think so. We, we, there was a comment from Stephen Lambert, who's one of our uh, excellent collaborators in in trachoma and also in our international work, saying, "Fantastic talk, Susanna! Congratulations on the partnership grant." So I think that's a great that's a great um, note to leave it on, and and thank everybody for their participation. Um, we'll we'll be continuing this sort of global health sub series next year. I think we're, we'll aim to have about four or five. Uh, present uh, presentations throughout the year within the Kirby Institute seminar series that have a focus on global health. So uh, we'll um, look, and look forward to engaging on these uh, these topics uh, throughout next year. So thank you, Susanna, and thank you, Elaine, for your fantastic support as usual for these seminars. Thank you. Thanks.